In recent years, I've been interested in studying some of the minority groups that participated as Americans in World War II and the contributions that those groups and a few of their members made to the effort. I developed a series of presentations based on those groups. The following is an introduction. Minority groups have always suffered discrimination in American society. The 16 million men and women who served in the US Armed Forces during World War II included over 1 million African Americans along with over 33,000 Japanese Americans, over 20,000 Chinese Americans, and nearly 25,000 Native Americans. Discrimination in the United States, however, played a significant role in their war efforts, even though many still made significant contributions. Few knew about those contributions because of their discrimination and because the United States government failed to properly reward their wartime efforts. The government attempted to rectify some of its failures in the years later, but by that time, many of the individuals in those groups were unfortunately no longer living. Here, I'm going to briefly describe each of the discriminated groups that are part of my Unsung Heroes of World War II series. Then I will direct you to a YouTube presentation that describes a World War II unit emanating from that group and one individual from that unit who can be legitimately described as a hero. I hope this summary will pique your interest in taking a look at those presentations. The first group that discriminated against was African Americans. The US government attended that slavery be abolished after the Civil War and three reconstruction amendments were added to the US Constitution. The 13th, ending slavery in 1865, the 14th, establishing citizenship and equal rights in 1868, and the 15th, guaranteeing voting rights in 1870. Jim Crow segregation, however, pervaded every aspect of American society, including the military, from its inception in the 1890s right on through World War II. African Americans fought in segregated units in the Civil War, the Indian Wars, the Spanish American War, and World War I. World War II was no exception. When African Americans volunteered or were drafted for service in World War II, approximately half of them were never even accepted for active duty as suitable segregated facilities or positions were not available, or so they said. Those who were accepted for active duty were assigned to segregated combat units or relegated to non-combat roles, such as cook, truck driver, quartermaster, and grave digger. Because of the gap between the promise and actuality of American freedom regarding race relations, many African-Americans felt alienated from the war effort and refused to participate. Others were able to overlook the discrimination they experienced and make significant contributions to the effort. The most well-known segregated units were the Buffalo Soldiers. They fought primarily in the Indian Wars during the late 19th century. The name Buffalo Soldiers and the division emblem Buffalo Head were transferred to the segregated 92nd Infantry Division that fought primarily in Italy during World War II. The 93rd Infantry Division was another segregated infantry division that fought in the South Pacific during the war, although the Buffalo designation was never associated with it. The Army Air Corps' all-white policy gave birth to another segregated group, the Tuskegee Airmen, who trained and lived on separate airfields and air bases. They endured unequal treatment but through combat missions in World War II, determined to prove that African Americans had the intellect, skill, and bravery to fly military aircraft in combat. The Tuskegee Airmen, who were members of the 332nd Fighter Group, flew as part of the 15th Air Force in Italy and became known as the Red-Tailed Angels. 
by the bomber groups that depended on them for protection. The second discriminated group was Native Americans. In 1830, President Andrew Jackson signed the Harmful Indian Removal Act by which several tribes east of the Mississippi River were forcibly removed from their territories and relocated to what was then called the Indian Colonization Zone in the Western states. Approximately 100,000 Native Americans were forced to make this move on foot with some bound in chains and marched double file. Many of them died along the way in this brutal removal of Native Americans from their homelands that became known as the Trail of Tears. In 1924, President Calvin Coolidge signed the Indian Citizenship Act, which supposedly granted Native Americans the right to US citizenship. Many in government saw that as, that as a way to further assimilate Native Americans into white society and break up their tribal nations. The act did not, however, guarantee Native Americans voting rights as the law continued to allow individual states to decide if they would be naturalized and whether to grant them the vote. As a result, many Native Americans remained disenfranchised. For example, states such as Colorado denied voting rights to Native Americans in 1937 by claiming that they were not really citizens. Utah did not consider Native Americans who lived on reservations state residents until 1956. And Minnesota required its voters to be civilized. Really? Nevertheless, Native Americans stepped up to make significant contributions to the World War II effort. In particular, the Navajo Code Talkers were members of all six Marine divisions that fought in the South Pacific. Based on their native language, they developed a unique code that they used to transmit tactical messages that the Japanese were never able to decode. The third discriminated group was Japanese Americans. Large scale Japanese migration to Hawaii began in 1885 and to the continental US soon after. Japanese immigrants found themselves the target of anti-Japanese sentiment that included a variety of legal restrictions promulgated against them. One of the most vexing for them was the denial of naturalization rights. So discrimination already. After Japan attacked Pearl Harbor on 7 December 1941, the American public and government largely regarded Japanese Americans as enemy aliens. They feared without evidence that Japanese Americans would join forces with their country of origin to participate in more attacks against the US. Largely because Japanese Americans were regarded as enemies and therefore viewed with suspicion, President Roosevelt signed an executive order in 1941 that resulted in the removal of more than 110,000 Japanese Americans on the West Coast from their homes and the seizure of their personal property. They were then placed in prison-like detention camps, which you can see in this photos, scattered throughout deserts in the Western states. At the time of this internment, some Nisai, which were first-generation Japanese Americans, were already serving in the military. Those still in training were removed from active duty and the military was advised to stop accepting new Nisai recruits. For those who had completed training and were serving on the US mainland, individual commanders were given the option of discharging them or, or assigning them to, quote, harmless duties, unquote. However, some within the Roosevelt administration soon reconsidered that action and policy and decided to again permit Japanese Americans to serve in the military. By early 1943, some 3,600 Nisai from the internment camps and another 22,000 from Hawaii 
have been recruited to all branches of the armed forces. An estimated 33,000 Japanese Americans eventually served in the US military during the war, 800 of whom were killed in action. Many of them were members of the 100th Infantry Battalion and the 442nd Regimental Combat Team, both of which became the most highly decorated units in US military history, fighting in both France and Italy. The last group, was female pilots. Women have always been targets of various forms of decent discrimination. The women's suffrage movement, a decades long fight to win the right to vote for women, began just before the Civil War. It then took activists and reformists nearly 100 years to win that right and the campaign was not easy. It was enthusiastic and ambitious, but prolonged and difficult. World War I slowed the campaign, but helped the suffragettes advance their argument nonetheless. The contributions made by American women were largely overlooked, but the reality is that women played a crucial role in America's victory. Without the efforts of women, tens of thousands of men needed at the front would have been tied to jobs in agriculture, industry, and home front military, and not available for wartime service. America's military effort might have been so successful if the I mean, women had not participated. Women's work on behalf of the war effort proved that they were just as patriotic and deserving of the right to vote as men. In 1920, the 19th Amendment to the Constitution was finally ratified in franchising all American women and declaring for the first time that they, like men, deserved all the rights and responsibilities of citizenship. In many ways, the story of women's employment during World War I was repeated during World War II. Despite their success in wartime industries during World War I, Similar stereotypes about women's capacity and ability to engage in men's work were circulated by the employers and the government. However, the needs of the wartime economy won again. In 1941, the government conscripted single women aged 20 to 30 as auxiliaries for the armed forces, for civil defense, and war industries. Women also served in many positions that directly supported military combat efforts. Approximately 74,000 women served in the Army and Navy Nurse Corps. They were excluded from all combat positions, but that did not keep the assignment of some to positions close to combat. Nurses served in or near combat zones or on naval ships, and some were killed. Women served in other military branches as well, usually doing more traditional women's work, such as administration, secretarial duties, or cleaning. Others took traditional men's jobs in non-combat work, such as chauffeuring and driving, to free men for, for combat. Although women wanted to participate in combat roles, men making the rules did not believe that they would be able to function in such capacities and prohibited them from doing so. Flying was one of those functions that women were prohibited from doing, largely because military commanders, always men, did not believe women could physically or emotionally handle the controls of combat aircraft. The Women's Air Force Service Program, or WASP, changed that. WASP had its origins with a pair of exceptionally skilled and ambitious female flyers who believed that they could contribute to the war effort. Prior to the US entry in the war, Nancy Harkness Love, the youngest American woman to earn a private pilot's license until that time, proposed that female pilots be able to ferry warplanes from factories to air bases. At the same time, Jacqueline Cochran, 
one of the most accomplished pilots of her era, demonstrated the feasibility of such an idea by flying a lend lease bomber across the ocean to the RAF in England, and then organizing 20 American female pilots that she took with her to England to fly a war transport service for the RAF Air Transport Auxiliary. <coughs> the US Army Air Corps then decided that if women could fly for the RAF, it could probably fly for the US Army. By 1942, combat, combat needs reduced the number of qualified male pilots available for transport duty, and American military leaders became increasingly receptive to Love's and Cochran's proposals. WASP, therefore, was created in 1943 and made a significant contribution to the war effort right through the end of 1944 by flying all types of combat aircraft in supportive roles. Now, the Unsung Heroes presentations included <clears throat> Uh, on this slide are part of the uh, series that are, are going to be available to you. Uh, the first one is the Women's Air Force Service Pilots, or WASP, the uh, <clears throat> female pilots. Second, or the NISAI, or the 447th Regimental Combat Team. Uh, fourth, are the Tuskegee Airmen, or the 332nd Fighter Group. Next, are the Navajo Code Talkers in the 1st Marine Division and then the Buffalo Soldiers of the 92nd Infantry Division. I've chosen one individual from each of those groups who deserves to be regarded as a military hero and also describe them as well. Uh, the five individuals are, first of all, Jacqueline Cochran, Lieutenant Colonel, United States Army, United States Air Force Reserve from the WASP. Daniel Inouye, Captain, United States Army from the 442nd Regimental Combat Team. Benjamin O. Davis, Jr., General, United States Air Force from the 332nd Fighter Group. Chester Nez, Corporal, United States Marine Corps from the 1st Marine Division. And Vernon J. Baker, 1st Lieutenant, United States Army from the 92nd Infantry Division. That's our introduction, and I hope that you will be willing to tune in to one or all of the different presentations. Thank you for tuning in today.